It's Thursday, September 10, 2020. Hello, I'm Mike Ryan, and this is BNAP Today. Today, we're joined by Kirk Kleit with the latest on the US elections and by one of America's leading CPAs, Blake Christian. But first, the headlines. What can be done to help the US economically recover from COVID-19? Blake Christian has some ideas next. Blake Christian is a tax partner at Holthouse, Carlin and Van Trite, the largest CPA firm headquartered in Southern California. Blake, thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Mike. Good to see you. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the US economy and business needs help to recover. What would you do if you were, the, um, if you were in, in government right now? What would you say maybe the three top things be to help business recover? Well, first of all, I would uh, force most governors, if they had reasonable statistics, to, uh, to open up uh, parts of their economy that uh, can safely be reopened. Uh, secondly, I would do uh, one more round of stimulus, uh, getting some money out to the individuals and then another layer to the public, but probably do those more in the form of loans and maybe even equity investments in some cases. And then um, third, I would um, continue to um, uh, back off on uh, or encourage states to back off on some of their regulations so that uh, business owners could um, can operate uh, efficiently and profitably. Can you update us then on the employment situation in the US? We hear conflicting figures at times. <laughs> Uh, so what's the Blake Christian figures or book of figures telling us? Well, uh, the, the numbers I heard today were in the, in the mid 8% eight unemployment rate. Um, you know, most of the uh, doomsdayers were predicting that we were going to have long-term unemployment in the, the 25 to 30% range. But you always, you know, the, the published rate of that eight and a half, roughly um, number that the government's uh, pushing, yeah, it's always a little bit understated because there's a group of people that have just given up on um, on applying f for jobs. And then secondly, in the environment we're in, because people were getting money till the end of July from the government, uh, they're only starting to, you know, maybe get back on the um, the employment um, hunt. So uh, it's probably a little bit low, but it's it's far from what the doomsdayers were saying. Which sectors are doing better than others in terms of recovery? Um, uh, looking at say your local area and looking at the nation as a whole. I think uh, you know just just core manufacturing, um, you know, is is less impacted. Um, professional service businesses, uh, 
companies with technology um, are getting through this much better than those that um, you know that hadn't embraced technology prior to COVID. Um, you know the uh, you know certain service industries. You know there's a lot of people that um, you know want to get out and about, and so um, you know there's uh, there's a lot of people that have been innovative. Um, you know. We're, we, we may not open for ski season. Um, we're, we're a resort town. And so, you know, there's there's an opportunity and there's people in town that are pivoting to uh, doing Nordic skiing, cross country skiing, mm. uh, snowmobiling, uh, snowshoeing and, and, you know, bringing those people that come into town or attracting them into town for alternatives rather than having a bunch of very... Uh, unbearable uh, procedures on the ski hill on, you know, how, mm. how many people can be on the lift and how slow that'll be to get to the top. So um, it's, it's the innovative people that are, are doing well, but, you know, hospitality is still, you know, is still suffering. Although I, I can tell you, you know, when I'm, when I'm, you know, walking by restaurants or driving by them, there's, there's a lot of people, um, you know, out, you know, looking looking for a for a good meal, they they're sick of their own cooking. Um, what what major federal and state incentives are available then to encourage business to employ workers? Well, there uh, you know there's a number of uh, federal uh, programs. There's the uh, the WATSI, the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program, which has been around for decades, and that uh, encourages people to hire. The, you know, kind of the most at-risk employees, um, those that live in uh, economically distressed areas. Um, it, it's for veterans of the military, certain veterans. Um, it's for ex-offenders, which is a nice way of, of saying people that have spent time in prison, um, as well as um, those people that have received, you know, are receiving food stamps and those types of things. So, you know, and it's a smart move because if uh, if the government can entice businesses to hire these hard to hire people, uh, they get off of some of these government uh, subsidy uh, programs, and then that's shifted over to the um, to the employer. Um, we have a lot of clients that uh, that you know do go out of their way to hire. Uh, that group of people, you can get up to a $9,300 tax credit um, in a given year for hiring uh, some of these, the, some of the subgroups that I just mentioned. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a real incentive to uh, to hire these people. So that's that's on the federal side. On the state side, it really varies. You know, we have 50 different states. Uh, not all states have have state income tax. But uh, we have, for example, we'll, we'll pick California because it's a big state. Uh, they have the California Competes Tax Credit. That is a, a program that you apply for. Uh, the, the minimum you can apply for is $20,000 in credits. Uh, beyond that, it's, you know, it, it's not, I shouldn't say the sky's the limit. It's $180 million uh, that they dole out per fiscal year. Mm. And uh, so they allow, there's a period of time that people apply for that. You have to show that you're, you're growing your business in California, that you, you know, might have um, opportunities to move um, to, a, to another state and, and that other state is offering you some incentives. And then they, you know, it's a ranking system and they eventually, um, you know, zero in on who they feel is the most entitled to those uh, those tax credits. So that's that's a big one on the California side. And they also have a, uh, which again is very important right now, is they have a um, California training pa panel program, they call it. And this can give companies, mid-sized companies, hundreds of thousands of dollars for training their employees. And again, they look at the competitive competitiveness you know, hey, you know, you're expanding your business or you're retaining your business in California. We know you can go to another state, but show us 
what what kind of training that you want to put in to retain your employees, improve their skill set, and if you're going to pay them more money uh, at the end of that training, then we're on board with you. We'll partner you with you on that. And as you show us the training program has been implemented, we'll we'll dole out the money over a period of time. Mm. A lot of my clients get those benefits, and they're, they're they can be very substantial. What's the latest on payroll tax deferments or reductions, and what impact do you expect this will have on recovery? Right. So you know. This we just had a discussion, uh, a CPA group uh, earlier. Oh, it was le- late last week, and um, the, I pulled I pulled the group of about uh, thirty people, and, and only two of them were were taking advantage of this. So, um, so the president um, and I am ninety percent sure this was executive order rather than. Uh, in fact, I'm positive it was executive order rather than passing through Congress, but. He, um, he, he implemented a, a tax, payroll tax deferment. And so, um, so, so basically you can elect not to um, withhold and deposit uh, payroll taxes, but you're going to have to, uh, you know, th- it doesn't go away, it's not an exemption, mm. uh, but he would, like to, he would like that to pass Congress. Uh, but he has, he has said, that if he is reelected, he'll make sure that uh, any deferred taxes get forgiven. So um, it's uh, it's an, it's an interesting play. But again, we're we're not seeing clients take advantage of it because they just feel it's just a deferral till year end, and you know why you know why hassle with it. If they uh, if the president does pass it, and so that you don't have to worry about getting or p- repaying it back or paying it back, um, and those that that have paid it, would they get the a credit back for what they have paid? Uh, you know, they haven't worked all those those details out, but from from the beginning, um, the um, you know the administration has been pushing for a payroll tax exemption, and so the Demo- the Democrats view it as, you know, why are we going to give this benefit to the employer? But I can tell you, being on the front lines with businesses, that they will absolutely hire more people. Um, you know, if if their cash flow is better that way, mm. and so um, so anyway, I, I'm I'm a fan of of the exemption, but uh, it's you know on a it, it he doesn't have bipartisan support for um, for mm. that position. Are there any well, other uh, incentives likely? Uh, well, right right now, I mean, most of the talk because there's just a complete impasse. The you know it's an election year here. It's um, you know, there, there's just so much friction between the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, I really don't, I'm not very optimistic anything can get passed um, until after the election or, or maybe into next year for that matter. So I think I think kind of what's on the books is about all we're going to get. They're, they're really pushing for, again, another stimu- stimulus checks uh, to, um, you know, to every taxpayer, uh, even those that haven't paid tax in the last year or two, uh, as well as, you know, some, you know, some, you know, a little bit of talk of, of maybe some more business incentives, but mm. uh, mainly on the individual side. Mm. Uh, and just finally, um, I have to ask you this because there is growing concern about disappearing postal boxes. Um, have you, in come clean here, Blake, are you nicking those postal boxes? We, we checked out <laughs> President Trump. He's not doing it. Uh, Nancy, well, she's not. Um, Joe Biden, he doesn't know. So are you stealing these postal boxes? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. And, and there, there is a long history. For, first of all, you know, they, they, there's a lot less mail uh, because most people are using emails mm. and things. I will tell you, you know, 80% of the, the what we refer to as snail mail that I receive is junk junk mail you mm. know, that's what keeps, that's what keeps the u.s postal system humming mm. is junk mail and so um and they, they do a fantastic job for whatever you know postages these days i don't we'll call it 56 percent, 56 mm. cents i'm not i'm not even positive uh but uh you know they can get a you know they can get a an envelope from you know from here to new york in a in a few days 
it's it's a pretty good bargain for all the flack they take, and they process a lot of stuff. So, well, I ordered uh, a, I ordered a package the other day because we're doing this from Australia at the moment, and uh, can't get out. Um, the I ordered this package. It came from New York. I got it within three, probably three, two or three working days. There's a weekend there. That's amazing. In Australia, you can send out a, a letter, and you're guaranteed to get it sometime. Right, right. Yeah, it's 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 impressive what they do. But they, yeah, there's there's that's not happening. The mailbox, if they're if they're getting moved, it's be because well, sometimes mm. they repaint them. Other times, they're just not used very much. So they they close it down, and you know people mm. will go to the post office or find another one. But having said that, I will be sending someone someone around to check your basement. I, you know, when you're looking like that sort of guy, that would nick. Postal boxes. Blake Christian from Holthouse Cullen and Men Try One more thing. How do they get hold of you to talk about anything to do with taxation, uh, anything that a CPA does, or postal boxes? So my email address is blake.christian, C H R I S T I A N, at H is in Harry, C is in Cat, P is in Victor, T is in Tom.com, our website is hcvt.com. Blake, thank you very much. Thank you, always good to hear from you. The 2020 US presidential election is on Tuesday, November 3, 2020. Kirk Clyde is our man on the ground, and he's next. As the world faces the challenges of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Lions recognize that kindness matters now more than ever. And Lions and Leos are finding ways to continue to serve our communities, including ordering food delivery for healthcare workers, holding story time for children online, and providing surgical masks to medical professionals and first responders. Empowering us to do more, Lions Club's International Foundation has provided nearly $2.5 million in grant funding for COVID-19 relief. And that support continues to grow. For more than 100 years, in times of need, Lions always find a way to help those around them. And after we emerge from this, we will be stronger than ever. Visit lionsclubs.org to learn more. While it's getting closer to the elections in uh, the US, the presidential elections, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. And uh, from the OLA, uh, Kirk Clyde, Kirk, uh, right. explain what OLA is. Oh, that's the OLA, Mike. That's the outdoor living area. And if you joined us last week, you've noticed we've had our fall set change. Now, still doesn't feel like fall. We were up to almost 46 degrees over the weekend. That is an all time record for not just the date, but for September. They were into the low 50s in Death Valley, not as warm as last month when it was 54.4, one of the hottest temperatures ever recorded on planet Earth. But the cooler weather, hopefully, will be here soon. And of course, we're getting set for fall and being in a Hispanic neighborhood, we also have to get set for Dia de Murtos. My uh -huh. Spanish is still terrible. <laughs> Dia de Murtos. It's Day of the Dead. Now, you know, one thing about living, I love these guys. I love these guys. See, we're, we've got them here mm. for you. It is an amazing festival that takes place in Mexico, end of October into November, where it honors the dead, the day of the dead. And, you know, living here in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood for now into my sixth year, my my Spanish, I still only know poco palabras, just a few words. So it's given me a lot of empathy for immigrants that come over because, mm. you know, for so long people say, speak English, it's America, speak English. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. Even Spanish, not as tough a language to learn as English. So I have real empathy for folks, especially that come over as an adult, as immigrants that have a little bit of trouble uh, immersing themselves with the English language. Because I should be able to speak Espanol by now. Now, Day of the Dead, Day of the Dead, just before we get into yes. it, that actually is probably Joe Biden's uh, next election rally. Now, no, before I give no, you a chance no, to reply to that no, one. Let's no, just no, talk no. About Day of the Dead. Dead, day of the dead with Joe Biden, what the Republicans did over the weekend. You know, mm. of course, Sunday, they claimed that Trump, the evangelicals, Trump was on the golf course. Joe Biden was in church 
And then he went out into the cemetery and and the reporters were saying, talk to you. And reporters are known to do as I have done in the past. And he didn't pay any attention to him. So the Republicans tweet this out as Joe Biden out of touch, not communicating with the media. He was in that cemetery to go pay respects to his son while his son was buried there. Mm. These are the kind of little small political dirty tricks that America has never seen really before, except for the last decade. And hopefully we're reaching a crescendo with it mm. as we do head into this election. And there will be a period of recovery for our nation after the election. But the future is unwritten, unfortunately. OK, uh, you need next time to have a wizard hat on. But because you can tell the future, you, you told me you can. You said Joe Biden's going to win. Anyway, moving along from Disneyland That's to the no. to the no no my turn now. Uh, moving okay. along, uh, the latest crazy things happening in the U.S. Oh, well, you know, you have a situation where Trump is into this boat parade situation now. They had one on a lake outside of Austin, and they weren't paying no attention to the wakes from some of the larger boats with all these flags. So five Trump boats and the Trump flotilla sunk. He had a deranged press conference here. I guess you really couldn't call it a press conference, kind of like a Trump rally in the White House where he's blasting Defense Department officials, saying how they're not happy because there's not enough war under Trump. Mm. This comes, of course, off his uh, losers and suckers comments, which they're denying like crazy because the people that heard it, some say former chief of staff, John Kelly, whose son was killed in action in Afghanistan, was one of those. But just because they don't have those folks, the reporters know who they are. They're saying, oh, it can't be true. But of course, remember back, say, 2011, 2012, Trump had plenty of informed sources telling him that Barack Obama was not born in the United States. So all kinds of interesting things there. New York Times just out with a big expose about how Trump is running out of money in the last year. They burned through $800 million, including uh, some ego boosters for Donald, like that Super Bowl ad that cost um, $11 million, and some really uh, interesting incidental expenditures. Of course, you may remember back in 20, uh, 2012, Mitt Romney got dinged really hard about the 47% that'll never vote for him. That was somebody recording in a private fundraising gathering. So what the Trump campaign has done is they have spent over $100,000 buying these magnetic cell phone holders that anybody who goes to one of these uh, fundraising receptions get the cell phone put in. So uh, what Trump says there does not become public knowledge. Now, and who knows? I bet there's some interesting things he says in those meetings. Mm. Which of the swing states to watch this time around and why? Well, you know, you've got a situation here, Mike, where you go back to 2016 and you got to remember the people that swung the election... <laughs> <laughs> That's evil. One of the dogs, Eve, or as I call it, evil. She's somebody coming. What's this outside? It's sounding like from, Kirk Doolittle. Kirk, Kirk <laughs> Dr. Doolittle. Well, we have at the house, we have seven large ducks, seven Peking ducks. And if they're bad, they become dinner. No, no, we don't. <laughs> we have two large rabbits and three dogs. So it almost is that way that we've uh, got going on here. So uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about in 2016, less than the full capacity of the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Grounds, decided the election. It was, uh, you'd have 20,000 seats left over. So it was only about 80,000 people over three key states. And those, of course, were Wisconsin, they were Michigan and Pennsylvania. Today, as I'm speaking, one of my old stomping grounds, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that's where Joe Biden is today. And Donald Trump, <laughs> that's right. When you hear Donald Trump, you start barking, right? That's exactly correct. Um, <laughs> one of the key states that was uh, that uh, was in play, of course, Wisconsin. Donald Trump always likes to talk about the Rasmussen poll, which shows him with the highest numbers, almost always with the highest numbers. And the new results were out for Wisconsin today. Let me put on my glasses here, just, you know, sign of age, so I don't get it wrong for you. In the uh, Wisconsin numbers that we had today, it was Biden with 51 percent, Trump 43. So if you've got a situation where it's an eight point lead in the poll that Trump likes best, 
you know there are some serious problems going on. And of course, the money issues, too. They've had to pull back on some TV campaign buys. So it would be truly remarkable for Trump to pull out Wisconsin. And of course, that Kenosha situation where you've had they had the kid that killed the two people, you had the cops shoot the guy in the back, that law and order campaign, at least for those folks in Wisconsin, that seems to be backfiring because they're saying this is the way America would be under Joe Biden. The caveat is Trump is not the challenger. He is the one who Mm. is in office. This is the way America is under Donald Trump. But having said that, the um, uh, each state, each city is uh, is run by its own political persuasion. And in the cases of the uh, the riots and the unrest, uh, the cities are are mainly uh, Dems and the um, the the states involved are mainly Democrats, just like the convention that you have at your house at the moment. The the Democrats are there. I'm going to hear Nancy. I get to hear Pocahontas <laughs> in the background. Now, look, uh, no. we, we must let this frivolity. No, no, no. Now, let, let's talk about what you're saying there. Oregon, I believe mm. it's Oregon. They've got another one of these, what looks like the ISIS convoy going. And what they have done is they've covered up their license plates. Now, can you imagine if there was a Black Lives Matter can convoy taking place and those license plates were covered up? What would the police do in that instance, it seems to be, and you know, I try to give the police a fair shake because a lot of times they do do a tough job. Mm. There are many good officers out there, but I really believe with my temperament, my personality, and what I've been through in life, uh, if I was a black man instead of a white man, I would have done some jail time. Mm. Now, <laughs> we'll leave the uh, the prison bait alone. Uh, what is the latest? <laughs> now, what's the latest on the presidential debates? Chris Wallace, a Democrat, works at Fox as the moderator for the first debate. How are the moderators chosen? And secondly, as a as a second question, can you see or maybe yourself as a mod- as a moderator, no, or if not, no. the dogs or the ducks? Or the rabbits you have at your house. The dogs, ducks, and rabbits. Well, I don't know about, I don't know your fact checking there on Chris Wallace being a, a Democrat. But yes, that debate is he coming is. up on the 29th. He, he leans, to, he leans to the left. All right, now we're at the bottom of your screen, Mike. Let's see a fact check on, uh, on, uh, on that fact. <laughs> no, I can't. The, dog, the ducks ate it. I'm sorry, I had it. I think it's actually, it. I think in some ways the argument can be made that clearly over the past few years because of that hard push to the right that Fox News has had because they live and die by the ratings. What some people may not know is every day there are ratings. Back in the stone ages when you and I Mm. started out in broadcasting, Mm. ratings basically came out every quarter. Now there's some some exceptions to that, but every quarter. Now there are ratings every day. And so you can tell, for instance, uh, what is happening on Fox with the Democratic convention. The viewers are turning it off. They're turning it on for the Republican convention. So there is a tremendous amount of pressure to keep those viewers watching on Fox. And Mm. generally speaking, they have kept their base, they have kept their base in place. So it could be argued that it's kind of insulting to the what I would call more traditional media to have Chris Wallace be the initial uh, questioner for the debate. But that is the way it is. And I think he will probably do a competent job. This will happen on the 29th. There's still uh, some stuff up in the air. Like, for instance, Trump wants them to have drug tests. I think I think Biden ought to say, let's go for it, you know, like athletes do at the Olympics. Let's have a drug test. That would be fascinating. But to again, again, what took place. And I am still not 100 percent convinced that these debates will take place because you've got something like Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen's new book out this week, Disloyal, it's number one on the Amazon uh, bestseller list. And he talks about in there how his real fear is that Donald Trump will do anything to stay in power, including start a war. And there may not be a peaceful transition to 2020, uh, 2021 in January. So if things get worse for him, Trump may claim he's distracted. He's Mm. working on this miracle vaccine. And they may not be the debates. But if there are, what we've got is, of course, September the 29th in Cleveland. Then we have the vice presidential debate. Oh, my. That is going to be amazing. Mm. USA Today print journalist here, Susan Page, she is going to host that Wednesday, October the 7th, about five hours from me, the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. 
Oh, Mike Pence doesn't know what he's in for against uh, Kamala. 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 Uh, then you've got the second debate, which is October the 7th. At, excuse me, that's the vice presidential debate. The second presidential debate a week later is uh, should be a town hall. Now, if that's going to come off, we don't know. That would be in Miami, and that will be hosted by uh, Steve Scully, who is with the C-SPAN. Of course, mm. C-SPAN. They don't get to express any opinions on that. <laughs> no, they, but, that but they do send their audience to sleep. It's like having the waves playing in the background, but you watch C-SPAN. Hey, it probably won't on this one. And then you have Kristen Welker to wrap things up in Nashville. She is the co-anchor of Weekend Today and the NBC News White House correspondent. Mm. So and she's very good, really, too. She's very good. It, it's really going to be Donald Trump's last chance with these debates. And one thing that the Biden campaign, you know, the Trump campaign has been saying, oh, Biden's been hanging out in the basement. Well, what, of course, he's been doing during the months of the pandemic here, running a lot of Zoom fundraising calls. They cost nothing. They generate millions of dollars. Trump doesn't like those things. So when this campaign began, Trump had a huge hundreds of millions of dollars in advantage. Mm. But now that has swung the other way, and Biden shows a tremendous fundraising advantage. As we speak, we have not seen the numbers for August, I believe, just off the top of my head. Biden picked up $385 million. So maybe the Trump campaign is a little reluctant to show their numbers mm. compared to uh, what the Democrats had picked up during the uh, month of August. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I was watching a clip from a year or two ago from Mad Dog Mattis. And believe me, I would much rather have James Mattis in control of the finger of the atomic trigger than Donald Trump. He, of course, was the Marine general who went on to become the Secretary of Defense, who Trump said was one of the most overrated generals ever. He had a great comment mm -hmm. in a roast. He would say, the only general, the only military figure, actually, he's not a general, a colonel, the only, <laughs> the only military figure that uh, Trump likes it's Colonel Sanders. And that's a great way to finish up. Uh, say hello to the ducks. Tell them that if I they will. make any the more man. noise, any more noise, duck confit is a very delicious dinner. I, I wish I could give you some eggs. I wish I could just <laughs> take some eggs and give them to you through the screen. Although it's been so hot this summer, mm. egg production has been way down. Because those girls, they, they don't like it when it's over 45. They're like, but, I, they want to chill. But chill no before. eggs, but you've given us pearls of wisdom. Kirk Clyde <laughs> from, from Vegas, the land of gambling. Thank you very much. Not anymore. <laughs> Bye. Well, that's it for BDAP Today, September 10, 2020. Be safe and be kind. I'm Mike Ryan.